الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد Let's uh, I just give you a code Rububiyya will use the word the, the letter U R and A and S for Asma al-Sifat Okay You see these three circles Okay If you want to put Ar-Rububiyya which circle of this will be Ar-Rububiyya? Which circle of this will be Al-Ilahiyya or Uluhiyya? Which circle will be Asma Sifat? The bigger one, which basically include everything. The bigger one is? Was Sifat. Sorry. Okay. Then, the second one, Rububiyya. Taif. The third one is Uluhiyya. Okay, the biggest circle they said Al Asma wa Sifat. So Al Asma wa Sifat include Rububiyya and Ilahiyya. Taif, there is anything in Ilahi. Ilah, it means the one you worship. So everything in worship, in worship is part of Al Asma wa Sifat. That's right? So Asma al-Sifat include Uluhiyya. Rububiyya, creator, sustainer, part of Al-Asma, part of Allah's names and attributes. That's right? So that's why that's absolutely correct. Al-Asma al-Sifat include both kind of Tawheed. You following me? If you not follow, if you not agree, if you confuse, stop me. No shame, there is nothing wrong with that. If you don't agree, even, just say, no, I don't agree. The second circle, you guys said, ar rububiyya Does ar rububiyya include Uluhiyya? Are you the one who said? No, you said that. You're the one who said, yeah, you was wrong. You're right, wrong. Rububiyya will include Ilahiyya? Is Ilahiyya part of Rububiyya? No. Rububiyya is part of Ilahiyya. That's right. Because you might worship Allah, you might believe Allah is the creator, but you don't worship Him. It's not part of it. So that's wrong. This one should be Uluhiyya. And this one is Rububiyya. And this one, Asma and Sifat. So if you truly believe in Allah's names and attributes, you have to worship Him correctly, and you have to believe in His Lordship. That's right? That's right? Good. طيب. This one lead to this one. So what this one should be? It's only one circle here. This is Asma and Sifat. Lead to what? Uluhiyya. Necessitate Uluhiyya. Leads to. So one, Al Asma and Sifat necessitate worshiping Allah alone. See, from, a, from another perspective now. Taib. Also, Uluhiyya, no, Rububiyya necessitate what? Rububiyya. Uh, Ulahiyya, sorry. Rububiyya necessitate Uluhiyya. Believing that Allah is the creator, believing Allah is the sustainer, that necessitate you to worship Him alone. That inquire lead to whatever. Okay? So that's how we said it before, earlier. We said, Tawheed al-Rububiyya necessitate al-Uluhiyya. And we said the Asma al-Sifat necessitate al-Uluhiyya also. But we also said that al-Uluhiyya include al-Rububiyya. And we said the Asma al-Sifat, this is a new one, include everyone else. Yeah, this is 
Al-Quran is all about Tawheed. Sometimes Al-Quran inform us about Allah, call us to worship Allah, commands and prohibition, prohib, uh, command us to do things, prohibit us from doing certain things. Talk about that he, type, if he command us and prohibit us, that's related to Tawheed, Luluhiyyah. And reward of those who establish Tawheed and the punishment of the people of Shirk. That's the whole entire Quran is about these five points. As Ibn al-Qayyim said, and so the whole Quran is calling for Tawheed. Calling for Tawheed. Either by defining it or by, or by telling about the reward of those who establish it and the punishment of those who reject it. Taib, what is here in these five points? Where is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah falls? In which point? Information about Allah. Tawheed al-Asma al-Sifat. Information about Allah. Call to worship Allah. Uluhiyyah. Excellent. Tayyib. We have the next chapter. He talked about the manhaj of Salaf al-Salih. Before we go that far, let me tell you a story. It's the story of this religion, which is a very interesting story, how this religion started. As you all know, it started with Muhammad Sallallahu calling people to Islam. They accepted Islam, Mecca, Medina, and Nabi Sallallahu living with them. They are familiar with the language of the Quran. If they couldn't understand anything, they go to the Prophet Sallallahu and they ask him, he will explain to them what this means, what the rules are, end of the story. The Prophet Sallallahu passed away. Okay? His companions take the duty to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, start going all over the places. And for the first time now, people who are not familiar with, with the language, who are not familiar with the nature of this religion, okay? So a lot of people start converted to Islam. A lot of people start becoming Muslims either by choice or by because they are hypocrites. They want to gain something. They are afraid or they thought this is maybe a way to hurt Islam more and there is people enter Islam and in reality they were not really Muslims. They enter Islam and they thought this is maybe the way to destroy it, this religion by inventing in it or adding it to what which was not which is not from it. As you will know, Abdullah ibn Saba' al-Yahudi and others. It's interesting to know that after the Islamic State expanded this tremendous amount of uh, uh, يعني, uh, uh, land and countries and people start accepting Islam and becoming Muslims. And those people, they have their own beliefs before that. Some of them were Christians, some of them were Jewish, some of them were Buddhist, pagans, Romans, Egyptian, Qabat, Kiptis, whatever background they had. Okay, so those people when they became Muslim, they already have, you cannot separate them from their history, from their past, even from their cultures. Because as you know, sometimes the the culture, the culture develops certain beliefs, certain ideologies. That's right. Every culture has something like that. Until today, until today, there is some pagan cultures among Arab. They inherited it generations after since the pagans. It's, it's part, became part of the culture. You'll see some Hindu culture exists until today in so many Muslims who generations of generations became Muslims. And the roots of it goes to Hinduism. And you'll see the same thing, Roman cultures or African cultures 
things like that. It's became part of the people who gener- lived generation after generation. They inherited that. It has an impact on the person. When those people became Muslim, and this huge amount of lands became under the rule of Islam, as you know, the number of the scholars are also limited to cover this mass number of people. People start bringing their own issues, their own way of thinking, way of analyzing things. And that's why there is new ideas that starts. New ideas starts. And these ideas, the root of it related to people or related to certain religion exist in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. That's one element. Another element I want you to think of, when you think of how the Islamic State became so wide, so big, also, that there is among those people who are Muslims, truly Muslims, who are familiar with the language, with the Arabic language, after generations, people will start to analyzing and understanding Al-Qur'an and As-Sunnah in different ways other than the earlier ones. Other than the earlier ones. Under the name of to be modern, modernize it, looking from new perspective, reforming, whatever you name it. And these things became what you would known as sects, firaq. And this is something you'll study in details for the next class. Taib. <coughs> and that would create divisions in the ummah. That had been divided to groups. To groups and sects. As the Prophet ﷺ have told us that that will happen eventually. And that's the nature of any, any way, of any ideology. By time, by time, any ideology, any theory. In, in history of humanity, any belief, any message, when time goes by, the later generations start adding and changing, and this adding and changing might create sects and groups and different uh, ideologies. It will be broke down. It will not remain the same all the time. But there is something unique about this religion. It's something very unique, and this is only for this religion that Allah promised to preserve and to keep the truth, and it will never vanish. No matter how much division will happen, can you believe that the division and the separation of this ummah will be even greater than what happened to the Jews and the Christians before us? The Prophet ﷺ said the Jews divided to 71, Christian to 72. Which in the number is not meant for itself. It's not necessarily to be 72 exactly. It means yeah, any Christian divide, they have more groups than the Jewish. And Muslim 73. Even, even worst. Even worst. More groups, more sects. But what's the difference between us and these nations? And Nabi Sallallahu said that in this ummah the truth will remain clear. <coughs> the ummahs, the nations before us, the truth remained, but it's not clear. Or part of it vanished, not exist. You cannot, you cannot say which one is the right one. That's why I believe personally, and that's my own theory, that Western philosophy that you cannot say there is an absolute true. Everything is relevant. Because there is, they never had that through the history, especially in Christianity, something called the ultimate truth, that you know for sure this is the truth. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ told us, that the difference is that this ummah, the truth will remain clear in it. Very clear. And not only clear, the Prophet ﷺ said, that this truth will be carried by victorious people. Mansur. Zahirin. Clear. You can tell that this is the right and this is wrong. We have concept in our religion, and it's a very unique concept. It's called innovation. 
and sunnah. It's not up to you. I can judge, I tell you, this is innovation, this bid'ah, rejected. It's not somebody comes and said, you know what, we agree as a group of scholars to do this, so we change. Like could happen in some other religion, some other uh, faiths. For Muslims, no. There is certain guidelines held the truth or save the truth from being vanished or mixed. No matter how com- confused, there's still the clear way of Muhammad Wasallam exists until today. And part of it that Allah preserved the Qur'an, unchangeable. A part of it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the sunnah of Muhammad Wasallam. And guess what? And part of it which is very important, that Allah also have saved for us the way of his companions. To explain to us what this textual evidence means. That's why Umar radiallahu anhu arda. That's why Umar radiallahu anhu arda. When he heard, when he heard that people in Sham, in Damascus, start reading Quran and memorizing Quran, he was mad. All these new convert Muslims and people became Muslims. One of his companions said, Ya Umar, I left people in Sham. Everybody reading Quran, everybody memorizing Quran. He said, this is what destroy nations before us. What he means by that, he said, and also this similar to the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the, the Torah and the Bible is in the hand of the Christian Jews. And still they misguided. They were misguided. Even the book of their Lord in their hand. Or so many of it is truth. But still they did not find the truth. It is about how to understand these textual evidence. The way to deal with these textual evidence. The way you understand Al-Qur'an and As-Sunnah, the way you deal with them. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, otherwise if the way to understand them, to use them, was not saved, this ummah, the truth will never remain, uh, remain in it. The truth will vanish. Give you an example. If somebody come and tell you, somebody come and tell you that, that, I have so many examples. I will just give you a very strong one. The one I have in my in my head now, I'm not that strong. They are clear, but not that strong. And I just start with what I have in my head, in my head now. Uh, just uh, I give you an example. If somebody come today to us and tell us that, yes, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, when He said, "Wa aqimu salat." Perform the prayer. He said, as salat in Arabic language, it means dua, making dhikr, supplications. So, iqamat as salat, performing salat by making dhikr any time in the day. No need for salat. That's what the Quran, Quran didn't say we have to make sujood and ruku every time. You can make ruku and make dua and ruku, not going to be the way we do it. We said, no, this is not the way to understand the Qur'an. If somebody tell you, you know what, Al-Qur'an has appearing meaning and heading meaning. as it means to keep the secrets of your shaykhs, as the Ba'atani Durziz said. If somebody comes and tell you, you know what, you're allowed to marry 27 women, wives. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَثْنَا وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَعَ Two times three, six. Six times four, 
that 24th woman. Uh, you might term two, three, four. He said, why you have, why you make adding? Why we don't say time? You see? If somebody comes and tell you that you know what, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sahaba, the companion, used to, used to seek barakah, blessings from his sweat and his hair and the remain of his wudu. So you know what, when Sheikh Walid drink coffee, you guys, is not, if somebody thinks that this Sheikh is righteous, let's drink the, the left of his cup and take the sweat or was Muhammad Sallallahu they used to do that. See, he, this is authentic hadith. This is verse in the Quran. But the way he understand it, this verse or this textual event was wrong. You see? It was wrong. That's why it, it is very important to understand that this deen will never be saved if the way to understand it was not saved as well. That's why Ibn al-Mubarak and so many other scholars said, the unique thing about our religion, something it called Isnad. You know what's Isnad? Chain of narrator. And if that's not exist, that concept is not exist, the deen will be mess. Why? Because it will not be preserved. Isnad basically, not only to guarantee you that, that, that it will not only guarantee the, the authenticity of the narration, it also will guarantee that how those people understand these textual evidence. I'm not maybe experts in Christianity or Judaism, but I read a little bit, because that's why I study when I graduated from college, comparative religions. But I don't recall, I don't remember that part of what they study, they analyze what the companions of Musa said about this. They don't analyze Isa's statement based on what is his companions did or said, like what we do in fiqh. That concept of fiqh we have. That's how Allah saved this religion. It's not only by saving textual evidence. It's by saving the way of dealing, understanding this textual evidence. And that's a very, very, very important point. And through the history of Islam, there is people have invented and created different ways of dealing with the religion. Sometimes with the whole entire religion, so they became, they have their own entire religion. Uh, yani it became another religion, like al Batiniya. They said everything has an appearance and hidden meaning. That's why they said there is no difference between al Khamr and the water. There is no difference between mother and sisters and any foreigner woman you don't relate to. All of them halal to marry. That's why they said there is no difference between a boy and a man. And a woman, or a female, or a male. Liwat, homosexuality, is exactly like marriage. That's why they said, there is no difference between worshipping Allah or the fire. Because it's all symbolic things. There is a hidden meaning behind it. You hear about this Estonian uh, Puerto Rican guy? Who claimed that he is God. he's originally from Houston. He claimed that he's Jesus. He's God. They had a show about him. Somebody's telling me his followers on internet, thousands, hundreds, thousands, I don't know. And he said that he's God. They even interview a woman, she said, I have only one God, this one who lived in the white suburban. He just passed by or something. Anyway, his house and for foreclosure, he didn't pay his payments. And he's like, Somebody was asked, Sheikh, how come there are so many people following him? I said, that's, he, that's nature of shaitan. He deceives so many people. When you see this bataniya that I just told you some of their ideas, part, sometimes in the history of Islam, they dominate the world. 
they were able to walk and to march to Mecca to destroy Al Kaaba, almost destroying, taking out the black stone and keep it in their country 21 years. Muslims go to Kaaba, no black stone. It's the Bataniya took it to their homeland in the east side of the Arab Peninsula. 21 years, no soldier, no Muslim had the guts to go and to fight and to get it back. And even how they get it back? By money. They did not get it back by fight. No, the Egyptians ruled on that time. Please, and you know, it's not going to look good. You know, if you go to Hajj, we'll give you money. Blah. They make a deal and they took it back. 21 years in power, in complete power. I said, if this people can deceive people like that, why not you see somebody like this who has followers? What I'm trying to say is, this division create a very important subject for the Muslim or necessitate, necessitate that the Muslim scholars talk about what kind of methodology the people should follow when they deal with the religion. And I said sometimes some people create their own methodology in talking about the religion in general, fiqh, aqidah, hadith, whatever, they have their own way. Exactly like Shia. Shia, they have their own way. They don't share with us the same reference of books of hadith. They don't say, say, share with us the same way of understanding the text of evidence in the Quran. They don't have the same usul fiqh that we have. They don't have the same chain of narrator that we have. They have the totally complete different methodology of understanding the deen. But you look to some other sects or some extreme Sufis who believe that dealing with the deen is that this religion is just a step to lead you to a level that you don't need any tech, you take directly from Allah. My heart told me that Allah said, that's it, no Ahmed, no Bukhari, no Muslim. Shortcut. This is totally different religion became. But there is other groups and say, they have invented different ways in dealing with different subjects. And sometimes it's related to Allah's names and attributes only. But other than Allah's name, which they are good. They deal with it as a very, in the, in the, in the way that Ahl-Sunnah deal. But they invented a new way of dealing with the methodology of, they have their own methodology when it comes to Allah's name and attributes. Or they may be in aqidah in general. But in fiqh, they are like, like, like Ahl-Sunnah. The people who follow the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ. They did not invent, they kept the same way. Some they have problem in fiqh, but they are good in aqidah. That's why the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is not, and it should not be only restricted to the aqidah issue. And that's something I call for it. And I, this is part of what I believe, and I, that's part of what the message I. I like to pass it to every single student of knowledge in the world. That the methodology of Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah must apply to the whole entire deen. That's why Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah said once beautiful statement. He said, I'm surprised that there is people like to follow the footstep of the Sunnah and the people of the Sunnah when it comes to Aqeed and Fiqh, but when it comes to Suluk, to softening their hearts, to da'wah, they will follow other methodology other than Ahl Sunnah. <coughs> you see people in their belief, they are absolutely correct. In Asma wa Sifat, all this good. But the methodology of dealing with the non-Muslim, for example, it's totally corrupted. That they will allow themselves to kill them, to rob them, to hurt them. But maybe in Tawheed al-Asma al-Sifat, they are good, they are right. That's why it's not fair to say that this is what Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah or the Salaf, the Salaf, the way of the Salaf lead to. No, they did not follow their methodology in all aspects. 
They, they follow them in one aspect, but they are not following them in the other aspect. And it's very important to, to know that the methodology of Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah is not restricted to one part of the religion. It is the way to deal with the whole entire religion. How to have a good akhlaq, how to be a good husband, how to be a good parent, how to be a good son or a daughter, how to be a righteous person, how can you have taqwa and to, to be a God-fearing person. This is, you need to look to the methodology of Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. Because there's other ways been invented to soften your heart. Like they tell you, like a, or to learn knowledge, or to uh, be righteous, zuhd, disattach yourself from dunya. Some people said, don't take shower for a whole year. So you, you, you still feel disgusted that you hate yourself, and that's how you're not going to have bride anymore. Is that the way of the Prophet ﷺ and the companion? Is that what the religion came to teach us? To stink? It comes to make us clean, feel good about ourselves, and to control our bride. So that's why I think it's essential and it's very important for us to understand whom our Sunnah wa Jama'ah are. We hear this word, okay, who are they? Because everybody can say, oh, okay, I'm not a sunnah, I follow the sunnah. And that's what we're going to explore, inshallah, tomorrow.